after my wife passed away, I was adrift in a sea of sorrow for what felt like an eternity. When I finally emerged from that dark period, I decided to dip my toes into the dating pool again. I was fifty-seven, and the world of romance had changed drastically since I was last single. The dating scene was a minefield of negativity. Each encounter left me more disheartened than the last. I met people who were quick to judge, always looking for flaws, and never satisfied with what life offered. It was a relentless cycle of hope followed by disappointment. One date stands out in my memory, not because it was particularly bad, but because it was the moment I realized I was done. We met for coffee, and from the get-go, she was critical of everything, from the cafe's ambience to the taste of her latte. As she went on a tirade about her exes and the woes of the world, I found myself tuning out, my mind wandering back to memories of my wife's gentle smile and the easy comfort of our life together. That night, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, and the words of my sister-in-law echoed in my head. Dating in midlife is like trying to find a parking place at the mall around Christmas. There are only a few and they are all handicapped. It was a humorous way to put it, but it rang true. The dating world felt like a chaotic rush for something scarce and rarely worth the trouble. I decided then and there that I was happier alone. I found peace in solitude, in the quiet moments of reflection, and in the freedom to live life on my terms. I embraced my hobbies, rekindled old friendships, and discovered that contentment doesn't always come from the company of others, but from within. As the years passed, I never looked back on my decision to stop dating. I was content, fulfilled, and at peace with the world and myself. It was a clear ending to my search for companionship and the beginning of a new chapter, one where I was the author of my own happiness. I met her on OkCupid, the kind of girl whose profile pictures hinted at a quirky charm. We exchanged messages, and our online conversations flowed effortlessly. She seemed nice, cool, and refreshingly real. So, we scheduled a night to meet at a dimly lit bar downtown. When I walked in, my eyes scanned the room. There she was, sitting at a corner table with four other people. But something was off. The girl who looked back at me bore only a faint resemblance to the one in the photos. Her hair, once a rich brown, was now bleached blonde, and her frame was more substantial than I'd anticipated. I hesitated, wondering if I'd stumbled upon the wrong group. She didn't make eye contact. Instead, she laughed uproariously with her friends, oblivious to my presence. I felt like an intruder, an outsider crashing their private party. But I'd come this far, so I settled onto a barstool and ordered a beer. Minutes stretched into an eternity. I nursed my drink, glancing over at her occasionally. She was still lost in her world of laughter and camaraderie. Maybe she was waiting for someone else too. Or perhaps she'd forgotten about our date altogether. Finally, she staggered over, her steps unsteady. Her breath reeked of alcohol, and her words slurred together as she introduced herself. I'm Megan, she said, emphasizing each syllable as if it were a Herculean effort. You're late. I blinked, taken aback. Late? But should have come over sooner, she interrupted, her anger flaring. I was waiting. I tried to explain that I hadn't recognized her, but she waved me off. Beer, she demanded, pointing at my half-empty glass. Let's catch up. So we sat there, two strangers in a dimly lit bar, sipping our beers. Megan's laughter turned raucous, and she leaned in too close, her words a jumble. You're not like the others, she slurred. Not a real man. Her friends watched, amused. They were like her, loud, unapologetic, and teetering on the edge of intoxication. One of them, a fiery redhead, leaned over. Megan's got a thing for dangerous men, she said, her eyes glinting. The kind who can handle a wild ride. I chuckled nervously, wondering how I'd ended up in this bizarre situation. 
Megan's other friend, a brunette with a wicked grin, chimed in. She's right. You're too safe. Safe. The word hung in the air, heavy with judgment. I wasn't the reckless adventurer they sought. I was just a guy who liked hiking, cabins, and quiet drives through winding roads. No adrenaline junkie here. As the night wore on, Megan's behavior grew more erratic. She swayed, her laughter turning manic. Guess what? She slurred, leaning in so close I could smell the alcohol on her breath. We've been sipping 151 in the bathroom. My secret stash. I raised an eyebrow. One hundred and fifty-one? That's firewater, she finished. Burns like hell, but it's liberating. Her friends giggled, and I wondered if they were all part of some secret society, the succubi of the bar. They reveled in chaos, seeking danger and intensity. And here I was, the outsider, the guy who'd wandered into their den. As closing time approached, Megan swayed to her feet. You coming? she asked, her eyes glassy. I hesitated. Coming where? To the edge, she whispered. Where real men leap. I shook my head. I'm not. But she was already stumbling away, her friends following. They vanished into the night, leaving me alone in the dimly lit bar. I paid my tab and stepped outside, the cold air hitting me like a splash of reality. And that's when I knew... I dodged a bullet. Megan and her wild friends were a whirlwind of chaos, and I was just a guy who liked cabins, hiking, and quiet drives. As I walked away, I glanced back at the bar, wondering if Megan would remember any of this tomorrow. But one thing was clear, I'd survived the night, unscathed and unburned. No ghosts, no fairy tales, just a bizarre encounter that would become my go-to story at parties. And that, my friends, is how I learned that sometimes, the most terrifying things wear human faces and sip 151 in dimly lit bathrooms. I remember it like it was yesterday. The Halloween party was a blast, and that's where I met her. Let's call her Elise. She was dressed as a witch, complete with a pointy hat and a mischievous glint in her eye. We hit it off, and I thought, why not go for a second date? That's where things took a turn for the worse. We decided on karaoke, a casual, fun night with friends. The evening started off great, with laughter and off-key singing. But as the night progressed, Elisa's demeanor changed. She became possessive, her eyes narrowing whenever I talked to my female friends. It was subtle at first, but then she started making snide remarks claiming I was hers and that they should back off. The air grew thick with tension. My friends were uncomfortable, and I was in disbelief. How could a fun night out turn so sour? I tried to laugh it off, hoping she was just joking, but the intensity in her eyes told a different story. I knew I had to act. As soon as we stepped out of the karaoke bar, I told her this wasn't going to work. She laughed it off, saying she was just being protective, but I could see the anger flash in her eyes. I stood my ground, firm yet polite, and made it clear that her behavior was unacceptable. The next few days were quiet, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I'd catch glimpses of someone in the crowd who looked like her, or I'd get anonymous messages that were just a bit too familiar. It was unnerving, to say the least but I didn't let fear dictate my life. I reached out to my friends, and we stuck together, making sure no one was ever left feeling unsafe. Eventually, the messages stopped, and the sightings became less frequent. I learned a valuable lesson about trusting my instincts and the importance of setting boundaries. Looking back, I'm grateful for the experience. It taught me to be more cautious to really get to know someone before letting them into my life. And most importantly, it showed me the strength of my friendships and the power of a supportive community. Life moved on, and so did I, with a story that's more chilling than any ghost tale because it was real, and it could have happened to anyone. 
It was a chilly evening in October when I matched with Mia on a dating app. She had a mysterious aura in her pictures, and her bio was a simple quote. Life is an adventure or nothing at all. We hit it off right away, chatting about our love for spontaneous trips and exotic food. After a week of texting, she suggested we skip the formalities and meet at a cozy little hotel she knew. I was hesitant, but curiosity got the better of me. I met Mia at the hotel lobby, and she greeted me with a warm, inviting smile. We went up to the room, which was decorated with soft lights and had a view of the city skyline. The night unfolded with laughter and stories, and I found myself genuinely enjoying her company. But as the clock neared 11 p.m., I mentioned I had an early morning meeting and needed to head out. That's when the atmosphere shifted. Mia's demeanor changed, her smile faded, and her eyes darkened. You can't leave, she said, her voice suddenly stern. I laughed it off, thinking she was joking, but she moved to block the door. I'm serious. You're not going anywhere. Panic set in as I realized this wasn't a joke. I tried to reason with her, but she was adamant, her words growing more threatening. If you leave, I'll scream. I'll tell everyone you forced me. I felt trapped, my mind racing for solutions. I couldn't risk a scandal, but I also couldn't stay. After what felt like hours of tense negotiation, I saw an opportunity when she momentarily stepped away from the door. I bolted, hearing her screams echo behind me as I ran down the hallway. I didn't stop until I reached the safety of the street, my heart pounding in my chest. The next day, I received a text from Mia, apologizing for her behavior and blaming it on too much wine. She assured me there were no hard feelings and wished me well. I blocked her number and tried to forget the whole ordeal, but the fear of that night lingered. I learned a valuable lesson about trusting my instincts and the dangers that can lurk behind a friendly face. 